Day after day, we are surrounded by the presence of criminals. We are spectators to the deepest darkness in human actions and the bizarre reality that someone's suffering can be a form of pleasure. As dedicated investigators of the criminal world, we're on a mission to uncover the most shocking crimes and get inside the minds of those who commit them. I am Luke, and today I bring you another unreal true crime. The Juan Fernando Hermosa Case Juan Fernando Hermosa Suarez came into the world on February 28, 1976, amidst the picturesque province of Sucumbios in Ecuador. His early life was shrouded in mystery, with no concrete information about his biological father and his mother, a humble laundry worker, struggling to provide for him. Consequently, when Juan was just a year old, destiny intervened, leading to his adoption by Rafael Hermosa and Zoila Suarez, a compassionate couple longing for children. They resided in a small and tranquil city in Ecuador until 1982 when a significant change transpired. Rafael sold their farm, and the family relocated to Quito the vibrant capital of Ecuador. Initially, Juan's life appeared to follow a typical trajectory. He experienced the ups and downs of childhood, marked by occasional erratic moods. However, a pivotal moment occurred when he was around seven years old. A young girl named Gloria entered the Hermosa family's life, altering its course. Gloria, at the tender age of 14, unveiled a startling revelation. She was Juan's sister. Gloria sought refuge with the Hermosa family, as her stepfather had cast her aside. Rafael and Zoila, known for their compassion, welcomed Gloria into their home. As time passed, Gloria found herself alone with Juan and chose to share a life-altering secret. Juan was adopted. This revelation, delivered without much consideration for his age and emotional readiness, left Juan grappling with profound questions. Gloria's presence also brought strife into the household, as she frequently disparaged Rafael and Zoila to Juan. Her tales included speculations about theft and flight from their home. Gloria's turbulent and disruptive behavior made it difficult for her to coexist with the Hermosa family, and she soon moved on. Juan's response to this revelation was tumultuous, as he mustered the courage to confront his adoptive parents tears welled up in his eyes. He posed the painful question of whether it was true that Rafael and Zoila were not his biological parents. Faced with the heart-wrenching truth, they had no choice but to share the details of Juan's adoption. Some people have the notion that criminal behavior can be attributed solely to the influence of one's upbringing. In this case, Juan's adoptive parents, though imperfect, made sincere efforts to guide him down the right path. Nevertheless, it became increasingly evident that Juan's trajectory was far from conventional. Juan's journey took a tumultuous turn as he spiraled into rebellion. Crossing the boundary of typical childhood behavior at the tender age of nine, it was during these formative years that he began a disturbing pattern of animal cruelty, primarily targeting cats. He would make a really bring their lifeless remains to school, seeking to shock and garner attention. Unsurprisingly, these actions resulted in multiple expulsions from school. In an attempt to curb his unruly behavior, Rafael, his adoptive father, resorted to occasional corporal punishment. Yet his discipline never escalated to a level that could be deemed excessive. In fact, it was evident that Juan did not hold any lingering grudges against Rafael or Zoila, his adoptive mother. Rafael's work commitments frequently led him to travel leaving Juan with more unsupervised time. Although Zoila provided some company, her hearing impairment and struggles with arthritis prevented her from being a constant presence. Consequently, Juan found himself increasingly isolated. 
Completing elementary school at the age of 12 was a significant accomplishment for Juan, given his penchant for petty theft. He had already embarked on a path of pilfering, selling whatever items he could lay his hands on. Remarkably, his criminal endeavors thus far had entailed relatively low levels of risk. However, at the age of 13, Juan became embroiled in a reckless car theft escapade alongside older boys. Assuming the role of a passenger, they initially evaded capture. Their audacious greed, however, led them to steal yet another vehicle, resulting in their apprehension. Juan's subsequent placement in a juvenile correctional facility underscored the urgent need for reform within these institutions. In the majority of cases, these facilities only served to further entrench delinquent behavior, treating these young individuals as hardened criminals. The meager mental assistance provided took the form of disconnected lectures, falling short of addressing their unique needs. Ultimately, these facilities inadvertently fostered camaraderie among these youths, often amplifying the influence of the already deeply troubled. Contrary to expectations, Huan found himself targeted within the correctional facility, not due to his physical stature or menacing appearance, but as a victim of severe bullying. Physical assaults and harsh verbal taunts became a daily ordeal. Amid this grim backdrop, a fellow inmate named Luis Anibal, merely two months older than Juan, entered the scene. Sharing a background of financial hardship, Luis's mother worked as a cleaner, but he had not been placed for adoption. Luis's circumstances were even more dire, with an abusive stepfather, mistreatment of his mother, and his sister subjected to similar horrors. Luis Anibal found himself on a perilous path marked by thefts and altercations, eventually leading him to the correctional facility. His presence there was not the consequence of a specific crime, but rather a desperate measure enacted by his mother, who hoped to redirect him onto the right track, only to inadvertently exacerbate his situation. Extended stays in the correctional facility, combined with shared experiences and a profound sense of disconnection from mainstream society, brought together these young men who struggled to forge connections elsewhere. In a bold endeavor, they even hired a taxi driver on an hourly basis to impart driving lessons. In no time, they became proficient behind the wheel of a car, coincidentally a taxi. The prospect of learning to drive infused these young men with excitement, for it heralded the initiation of their car theft endeavors. Their maiden foray into auto theft involved a Hyundai accent, a venture that left no casualties except for Guan and Anibal themselves, who, presumably due to nerves, met with a road mishap. Providentially, their escapade went unnoticed, and they managed to elude capture. Their subsequent car theft also ended in an encounter with law enforcement. However, they had meticulously prepared for such an eventuality, carrying counterfeit credentials purporting them to be the offspring of officers stationed in Quito. It goes without saying that these claims were entirely fabricated, unbeknownst to the genuine officers. Fortuitously for the boys, they were intercepted by a sergeant and a corporal who were unacquainted with the officers they impersonated, hence readily accepting the spurious credentials. Inquisitive officers questioned the boys about the car, intuitively discerning that it was unusual for the child of an officer to possess such a vehicle. Displaying remarkable cunning, the boys explained that it was a stolen car their father had managed to recover. The officers, harboring suspicions, suggested changing the vehicle's tires. It's important to note that some may not be familiar with the prevalent practice in Latin America, where police recover stolen cars, strip them of valuable parts for resale, and subsequently lay blame on the thieves for causing damage to the vehicle. The boys consented, offering to replace any components with lower quality substitutes in exchange for monetary compensation. The officers agreed, and an arrangement that left all parties' content ensued. This modus operandi persisted for a while, initially yielding limited results, while leaving a disco with friends on November 22, 1991. 
of Juan, and his group took a taxi. Hermosa pulled out a pistol obtained through a guard, shooting the driver in the head and killing him instantly. One of his friends then drove the vehicle to the southeast of the city and disposed of the body in the Los Chios Valley, where the body was found by police the next day. A week later, Hermosa went with other members of his gang to a hairdresser where he usually fixed his hair, operated by a transgender named Charlie. Charlie invited them to drink at home, where they started an argument which ended in Hermosa shooting Charlie five times before he could ask for help. Hermosa's crimes totaled 22 murders, occurring in only four months, claiming the lives of eight taxi drivers, 11 homosexuals, a truck driver and his acquaintance, as well as two others, earning him the nickname, the Kid of Terror. The victims were shot to death with a pistol, the crimes occurring during the weekends, which caused a panic among the taxi drivers and homosexuals who lived in northern Quito. One fateful morning, patrolling officers were alerted by what sounded like gunshots, prompting them to initiate a strategic sweep of the vicinity. Guided by the direction of the gunshots, they arrived on an almost deserted street, where a taxi was observed traversing the area. Reacting swiftly, the officers accelerated, overtaking the taxi and discerning the presence of several miners inside. Recognizing that the police were in pursuit, the young individuals accelerated, yet the officers were undeterred, maintaining their vigilance. And when they realized that escaping in the taxi wasn't going to be possible, they stopped and opened all four doors to run in opposite directions. They were only able to capture one suspect, and that was Luis Anibal. Luis was taken to the police station, and they began questioning him to get a confession, but he didn't utter a single word. Days passed, along with threats because the taxi he fled from belonged to a man who had been murdered a few hours earlier. Still, Luis remained silent until a group of boys came to visit him to see what was going on with him. This seemed odd to the police because they had kept this capture hidden, and only a few relatives knew that Luis was there. These boys, seeing that Lewis couldn't get out, left the place. But the officers, seeing that the presumed suspects were minors and their profile matched perfectly, assigned an undercover officer to see what their next moves would be. Throughout the day, the detective saw that these boys seemed to spend the whole day together, hanging out in the streets. In the evening, they entered a nightclub and more agents were called to see if they would take the bait that was about to be set. In the early morning, when the boys left the nightclub, a taxi passed nearby, and they stopped it. Several agents were already following the taxi, and indeed, these boys had the intention of assaulting the taxi driver, but he was also an agent, and practically the whole gang of terror was captured. But their leader, Juan, had not been with them. Under pressure, the boys confessed, but they claimed they were not responsible for the murders and that Juan Carlos was the culprit. Juan Carlos was the name Juan Fernando used to have a different identity as a criminal and protect his real identity. In contrast, Luis used the alias Santiago. The police began to investigate Juan Fernando Hermosa and found his address. At that time, Juan lived with Zoila, and Rafael was not at home. On January 14, 1992, in the early morning, Several officers began to surround Juan's house and entered through a skylight. Juan realized this, grabbed his gun, and a shootout ensued. Unfortunately, since he was sleeping in the same bed with his mother, and she may not have heard due to her deafness, she stayed in bed. In the exchange of fire, Zoila was hit by 19 bullets, leading to her death. Juan attempted to escape, threw a grenade at the police, and when he was climbing out of a window to escape, he was captured. Subsequently, following Juan's grenade launch, testimonies surfaced from both Juan and the neighbors, attesting that it was, in fact, the police who had lobbed the grenade. Countless enigmas enveloped the circumstances leading to Zoila's tragic fate. It raises questions about why she was swiftly transported away in an ambulance when it was patently evident that she had already departed from this world. Standard procedure dictates that, when someone is unmistakably deceased, 
they should remain at the scene for forensic evaluation. Upon his arrival at the police precinct, Juan unambiguously declared as I quote, I want to clarify that my name is Juan Fernando Hermosa Suarez, and on February 28th, I will celebrate my 16th birthday. This stratagem was employed to exploit legal provisions, given his status as a minor, and it elicited an explosion of media coverage. Juan ascended to a newfound level of notoriety, capturing the headlines in every newspaper. On numerous occasions, he participated in interviews for which he received compensation. Juan took all the blame for himself and wanted to leave his companions out of it. However, seeing that he also didn't want to receive many years in prison, he began to create excuses, claiming that a supposed general, who does exist, had hired him to commit all these crimes because of the death of his daughter, which was attributed to a supposed taxi driver. This was taken seriously because the other kids also started saying the same thing. The authorities were so stirred by this that they seriously began to investigate the general. They asked these kids about how he looked, and they said he was of average height and had prominent hair, but that wasn't accurate. He was tall and always had a military haircut. It also makes perfect sense that a general with all the connections in the world would hire a 15-year-old kid like Juan, who was a complete stranger. The authorities dismissed the accusations, and Juan began to make more excuses. Now he claimed that the taxi drivers were responsible for their own deaths. Clearly, he was still a child. He insisted that the last thing he wanted was to kill. He stated, I asked them to stay still, that nothing would happen to them. But that didn't happen. Once again, I was threatened with a revolver, so I used my weapon. And a taxi driver tried to hit me with a lug wrench, so I was also forced to shoot. But even if that were true, this excuse wouldn't hold up because he had murdered 22 people by that point. There was no way he could be saved because he was young. It's not like he was suddenly going to turn his life around. And Juan confirmed this. At the time of his trial, Juan was already 16 years old and was sentenced to just four years at an orientation center because that was the maximum penalty for a minor in Ecuador. Juan underwent several psychological exams, which mostly described him as an organized psychopath. This type of psychopath tends to be natural leaders, and it was within 16 months of being in that center that Juan formed a gang and devised a plan to escape. He had a girl who had accompanied him in a previous taxi robbery arranged to meet him on the day of his visits. They had agreed that she would deliver a pistol to him so he could escape. In a juvenile center, the security wasn't as high, and Juan knew that at some point there would only be one guard watching the exit. When this happened, he seized the opportunity and shot the sole remaining guard with five shots, causing his death. Immediately, Juan and 10 other young people managed to escape from there. The news once again exploded, and somehow, Juan quickly managed to escape to Colombia, reaching Bogota. He began to live off the sale of stolen jewelry, but being in a new country where he was also being pursued, he couldn't steal as easily as he could in Ecuador. So shortly after, he was found, and tired of going hungry, he told the police, yes, I am Juan Fernando Hermosa, and he was sent back to Ecuador. He was temporarily placed in a high security cell, but was soon returned to the same orientation center from which he had escaped before. However, this time, he didn't escape again. He didn't even serve the initial four-year sentence they had given him, despite having killed a guard and escaped to Colombia. Many couldn't believe it, but in January 1996, Juan was already free and this obviously caused a lot of resentment in many people who saw the judicial system as a failure. Juan returned to his childhood town, where he began to live with Rafael. In the early days, Juan seemed enthusiastic about finding a job, but no one wanted to hire him until Rafael contacted a friend who could give Juan a job in a bus collecting money. He started working and gradually began to enjoy the nightlife again although it is assumed that he only went out to party and consume alcohol. On February 26, 1996, 
Juan had gone out with some friends to a bar around 10 p.m. At 12, the bar owner asked him to leave because the more the other customers consumed alcohol, the more they expressed their disgust for Juan, as his face and what he had done were known throughout the country. He had no choice but to board a bus and leave. Two days later, Rafael received a call from the police, informing him that they had found what appeared to be his son's body near a river. The body was unrecognizable, not due to decomposition, but because it had been beaten, tortured, and assaulted in every possible way, even run over by a car with his hands tied with wire. He was only identified as Juan because he had his identification in his pockets and next to the body, they had left a newspaper clipping that said, the Hermoso syndrome throughout the country. The body was found on the same day that Juan was supposed to turn 20. Some say that the perpetrators were contacts of the officers he had deals with, but it could have been anyone because this young man had made enemies from all sides. And that's the end of today's case. As always, I appreciate your support for my work. If you subscribe, like, and share this video, it will help me continue creating content. This was another episode of Unreal True Crime. See you soon.